I'm delighted to welcome you and to introduce to you our second speaker in the series we have on black theology. Dr. Malcolm, Reverend Dr. Malcolm Newton did a fantastic um, job last week, a, a tr tremendous lecture. And I know some of you responded and said, my mind is so stretched. You know, I'm trying to, I'm trying, how do I hear more about this? And so we encourage you to um, go back and listen again to the recording of his um, lecture last week. It was great. Um, so again, Dr. Newton, thank you so much. And so this session, uh, session two, is uh, brought to us by Reverend Dr. Uh, Marjorie Lewis. Dr. Lewis is also a member of Montview Church, so we are fortunate to have her. Uh, Marjorie is a, if you don't mind me saying Marjorie, uh, Dr. Lewis is an ordained uh, minister in the American Baptist Church. Shh, we used to have one of those, but he came over to the Presbyterian side, so, well, we won't expect that of you, Marjorie. Um, she's also a, 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 has her PhD in the C convergence of disciplines of economics and public policy analysis, theology, and mental health, and uh, calls herself a behavioral economist. So um, it's, she is, has a rich background and a rich understanding of the breadth of human nature and theology. She calls herself a womanist theologian, which I so appreciate and will appreciate hearing more about that. Her, her book is called Singing Songs in a Strange Land, Anecdotes of Resilience. Uh, this presentation will demonstrate the power of black theology as a metaphorical song of empowerment for humankind. Good morning. I just want to, and this is the obsessive part of me. One of my first cousins told me, if you ever say you're something, you'd better have a piece of paper to prove it. And... Yes, I do call myself a behavioral economist because I went back and got another piece of paper to verify the convergence of all of my disciplines. And today, I want to express gratitude to the co-pastors, Clover, Ian, or Ian Clover. You know, you just, if I could just combine them into one name, that's what I would do. Yes. And I also want to thank my colleague, Malcolm Newton, for inviting me to be a part of this. And I do want to <laughs> take a minute to let you know there's a reason why we condense so much into this. It took two years to get up here, so we're just making the most <laughs> of the opportunity. So I just want to express gratitude and humility. I do have slides. I uh, was told that I'm a preacher that uses slides. So that's how it's going to go. In relation to this second phase, we are sort of unpacking the concept of black theology, black woman theology, white theology, white woman's theology, and everything in between. Because the reality is, quiet as is kept, we all have a theology. And we join the Montview Presbyterian Church in the commitment to hear all theologies in order to reflect infinity and eternity. Individually, we are a very poor image of God. The more people we have talking about their experiences with God, the more we reflect the image and the likeness of infinity and eternity. In relation to the essence of this presentation and also the motivation for the preamble of my book, it's really answering a question 
that was posed by the tribe of Judah in relation to their captivity. And we know the story, captive and then expected to sing the songs of Zion while they were captured, enslaved. And the question that is asked in the book of Psalms is this, how can we sing a song in this strange land? But we know as the story of the tribe of Judah goes, they sang more than a song because we know our model of salvation, Jesus the Christ came out of the tribe of Judah. And I share that because that is the biblical validation in relation to black theology. How can we sing a song in a strange land? And my answer, ask black, pe black people in America. We'll show you how to do it. And as we begin, I am going to invite us to hear a contemporary rendition of what we call Lift Every Voice. Some call it the Black National Anthem. I do want to share the fact that in relation to um, the expressed need for a reconciliation relative to theologies, I want to share an experience that I had as a member of the anti-racism trust team here in Montview. And as we have learned about the history of, uh, I will say, a lack of accommodating theologies, particularly in relation to, say, the status quo church. Looking at the work of Jamal Tisby, the question or the statements were made, and there are two statements that capture the attention. One statement was made by a member who said, 
given the way the white church has treated black people, I can't understand why they would even want to be Christian. That's one end of it. Then there was another response, and that was this. If white people knew who Jesus really was, they wouldn't want to be Christian. And the bottom line is, both of those, one might be a little more politically acceptable, but both of those reflect a limited insight into God. Because Christ, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, all of that is just too big to constrain to any one group's perspective, you see. And that is what's motivating this presentation. This discourse is an example of the reconciliation of extreme perspectives. And it is shared in an effort to bring us all into a place where we understand that infinity and eternity cannot be constrained to any one perspective of God. So we were gonna start with a contemporary rendition of Lift Every Voice, but I'll tell you this, I can make it available. Kirk Franklin and his choir sings it in ways that will bring tears to your eyes. And as we move on, I do want to share the fact that perspectives of black theology precede yesterday, exist today, and will continue after tomorrow. And the Bishop Jerry Demmer, who is the former president of the Greater Metropolitan Denver Ministerial Alliance, shared some of his perspectives around God, theology, black theology that existed from the time we left the shores of Africa. And in relation to, can I? Yep. Okay. In relation to <clears throat> understanding the fact that black theology is not new, it's just being recognized. He says, resilience in the African American community has been practiced ever since we landed on the shores of this country. And then he refers to Psalm 137, verse 4. Imagine the hypocrisy of the captives, captors asking the captives to sing happy, glorious, victorious songs in captivity. While they did not sing songs, we as United States citizens of African descent did and still do. We sing songs of joy, we sing songs powerfully, we sing songs victoriously. And history tells us that the captured slaves on their way to America sang songs also. They didn't sing the songs in English, but they did sing the songs of Moses. They sang those songs on their way to these shores, and we have been singing them ever since. These songs of resilience exemplify a resolve that has existed in our community ever since we landed on these shores. We never internalized our subservient role. It was a mask we wore to protect our descendants of today. We knew exactly what we were doing. And even though we yielded, we never did succumb. And that is a testi it's testified in relation to slave narratives, theologians who took the time to interview the last iteration of slaves in this country. As United States citizens of African descent, I call them imported black Americans. We are inspired by song. Song being synonymous with theology. Song being synonymous with our explanation, our experience with God. It was Judah, the praise tribe of Israel, who was asked to sing the songs. And it would be appropriate because Judah was the praise part of the tribe of Israel. It was Judah that went into exile in Babylonia. 
Yet, it was Judah that brought forth Jesus the Christ. And when we use that example, you can understand why black people sing even in the suffering, sing in the endurance, because we know that we too have a gift to give. And in relation to the suffering, we're thinking that it's a pretty big gift that we can anticipate. Every member of our African community must remember the songs that were sung to us as we represent our ancestry, flourishing in the pit of hell, beginning with slavery and haunting us even today. Our story of resilience sung universally and individually through the blues, the gospels, the spirituals, and the anthems through the wise sayings of our angels of resilience are why we continue to grow in strength and collective power as a people, endurance and victory. We sang our way through displacement. We sing our way through tyranny, rape, and murder. We are still here collectively thriving more with each new day. Oh yeah, we can show you how to flourish even in th slavery through the Harriet Tubmans and the Frederick Douglasses and so many other theologians who allowed the world to see the power of God working even in the worst of circumstances. And we will keep singing. We will keep singing until the storm of racial bigotry passes over, not only for black people, but for all people of these United States of America. And nothing can stop us from bringing forth salvation in the name of Christ, just as nothing could stop the tribe of Judah from bringing forth Jesus the Christ. And so, as we evolved clinging <clears throat> to our theology, clinging to our theology with all of our lives, we realized that there were songs that were sung yesterday, and there were songs or are songs that are sung today. And when I think about today, I'm thinking about the 20th century and the 21st century. And as we look at black theology, as it becomes more and more grafted into mainstream, we have to remember the historically black colleges and universities because this is where black theology began to take shape enough for it to be recognized as valid. Places like Morehouse, places like Howard University, places like Shaw University, places like so many other universities, Emory and so many other universities, started with schools of theology. And the schools of theology actually sort of began to reconcile, identifying the intersection between what I'll call classical theology and this new emerging expansion such that the shoes that we want to put on God wouldn't be too small. And I often would listen to my father who went to the School of Theology at Shaw University, and I would listen to him as he would say, we would hear what the classic theologians would share, and then we would bring our own take on it. And it did begin to make sense to the world. And in relation to uh, the call, in relation to the response, I want to share the preface to my book that talks about black theology today, 20th and 21st century. As a US citizen of African descent and a woman in my, I didn't mean to say this, but in my 70th year of life, I have seen a situation, stark examples of ruthless oppression ever since I was old enough to leave the sanctity 
of my parents' home. Its deadly manifestations to the health of people of color directly identified with Africa is certainly nothing new. Yet the trauma is continuous, comprehensive, and compound. Never mind complex. Through the theology within me and through others, I have learned not to be distracted by attempts at intimidation, by an oppressive social order that existed and still exists since the genesis of my people's arrival on these shores. I know that the perceived genesis of United States citizens of African descent in this country was that of servitude and submission. More importantly, I know that while this was our contextual genesis, and while this genesis cannot escape the minds of many, it did not define my ancestors just as it does not define me. Most importantly, I also know this is why there are such unspeakable, cruel attempts yesterday, today, and even tomorrow to keep my people in their place, a place where we really never fit. We shall not conform to this world as we are transformed by the renewing of our minds and the renewing of the perspectives of the world. The genesis of my oppression and the oppression of my people is the price we pay for being a model of deliverance and of the power of the creator. When the Hebrew people pose the question, how can we sing a song in a strange land, they should have asked black people. The birthing of our liberation has been long and hard and unbelievably horrific, and it is not over. Yet, through it all, we have never ceased to sing our songs of victory. Through it all, we have learned to trust in Jesus and to depend upon, believe it or not, the word of God. For those who are short-sighted, this contemporary scenario of terror, savagery, and horror may seem hopeless. However, for those of us who have seen or read of it before, it is a contemporary story directly out of the annals of the Bible. How can we sing a song in a strange land? My resilience is enhanced through my prayers for the comfort of my people, including those of us who suffer the horrors of oppression directly or vicariously. My resilience is further enhanced through my prayer for compassion in relation to those who visit atrocities on black people. You see, I know the Moses story, and it does not end well for the oppressor. In the meantime, we will continue to move along the path directed by the creator, overcoming the oppressor repeatedly and again. We will continue our collective growth in the power of Christ as we move closer <laughs> to the Red Sea. And that captures the struggle that's going on now. It captures the struggle of today. Black theology has emerged and it is growing. It's growing because it actually brings intersection relative to the fact that we all have a theology. And we all have come to understand, as I was talking with Clover, the importance of all voices representing infinity and eternity. You and I individually represent a very poor image of God. How can I represent infinity and eternity. And I love Clover because we agree, if you want to reflect God, you gotta get in touch with every human being from the time we could think cognitively until the time that we will no longer exist 
in every nook and cranny of this world in order to reflect infinity and eternity. Not only are you and I poor images of God, but when we come collectively trying to represent a sociological perspective, when we come together to talk about black theology, white theology, women's theology, those are just aspects of infinity and eternity. So as we continue to grow, I would like to visit very briefly three characters that my colleague, Dr. Newton, shared about last week. W.E.B. Du Bois, <laughs> he named the issue in relation to the 20th, 21st century, and God, I hope not, perhaps the 22nd century. And he said what? <laughs> the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. I know that many of us here at the Montview Church recognize that. And this is why Malcolm, myself, uh, can stand before you last week, this week, and next week. And this is why the anti-racism trust team exists. We know the importance of making room for theology, alternative theologies. I guess I'll call it neoclassical theology. You see, because you got to frame it some kind of way to make it sound impressive to the scholars. So we're neoclassical theologians. The women who came forth, neoclassical theologians. theologians. The black people who came forth, neoclassical theologians. The black women who came forth, neoclassical theo theologians. And then when we consider Martin and Malcolm, who <clears throat> in relation to the discourse, that discourse was well presented last week. But there is an intersectionality between these two champions. And that intersectionality is found in the fact that they were both theologians. They were both men of God. They both believed in the God who will be with you in the struggle. And so as we begin to understand that fact, we will realize that Martin and Malcolm had more in common or as much in common as they did in relation to the discourse. Just want to share as we meander through the theological component, the black theological component, people who preceded Malcolm and Martin, people who taught them, people who mentored them. And when we talk about Martin Luther King, it's very hard to exclude people like Howard Thurman. Now, I'm not saying that he was the only one who influenced, because we know that Gandhi certainly was, but we happen to be talking about black theology today. And so as we talk about black theology in relation to Martin and a black theologian, some, of us, some, of, some people call him a mystic, that's because they couldn't put him in a theological category. Howard Thurman, <laughs> taught Malcolm that Jesus was the savior of everybody, even those who are identified as being disinherited, the ones that are poor, the ones that are underprivileged, the ones that are underrepresented. And he has a whole library of books that address that. This is just one of them. Our own uh, beloved Vincent Harding, who, by the way, hails from, hailed from Iliff School of Theology, was a friend of Martin's. He knew him as a colleague. And in a video that I can make available, we're not going to play around with the technology again. <laughs> in relation to what he had to say, he expounds on the title of his book, The Inconvenient Hero. Martin Luther King. He shares a part of Martin that, Dr. King, Reverend Dr. King, forgive me. He shares a part of his existence that many people don't see. All they see is a national holiday being named after this great giant, but his friend knew there was more to this story. Martin Luther King, he says, was an, was an inconvenient hero. 
You see, during his lifetime, he wasn't nearly as popular as he is today. You had white people looking at him crazy, but you also had black people looking at him crazy. You're starting something. Don't do it. It's dangerous, you see. But he persevered because he heard a voice saying, you have to go beyond yourself. It's not going to be comfortable. And by the way, you'll probably be alone. And in relation to the interview that uh, Vincent Harding shared, uh-oh, Okay. In relation to the interview that Vincent Harding shared, he just pointed out that Malcolm, as a prophet, challenged the country. And as a human, he loved the country. He was too much for many. <laughs> if you want to understand how the contrast affected many, ask somebody about the establishment of what we call the Progressive National Convention. Uh, in response to Dr. King's statement, the greatest Christian I ever knew was Mahatma Gandhi. You see, he understand, understood who the Christ was. And he recognized that, that the Christ goes way beyond religious orientations. Then we are, I'm not going to, okay. I don't want to hear him. I just want to, huh. So how can I, so as we sort of move through, I just want to go, oh, I'm not seeing what's on the screen. Okay, that's okay, I can, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Okay, as we begin to continue in relation to, uh, forgive me, the technology's just not working for me. As we look at other shoulders on which one of these two black leaders stood, we realized that Malcolm was influenced by a man of God too. We often don't identify with him because he's Islamic, but it was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You see, he informed uh, Malcolm X's perspective, especially early on. And then Malcolm outgrew because as you move closer to infinity and eternity, the shoes that you're forced to wear simply won't fit anymore. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, through Malcolm X, did provide an insight about God that many of us can't even imagine. And by the way, he, 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 he had some insight on how to police the black community. Maybe we need to read that as we move through the process. And so as we begin to look at the discourse between these two men, we can also see the intersectionality as the theology of the black community begins to emerge into mainstream. And as the black theology began to emerge into mainstream, the capacity to learn about it grew from historically black colleges and universities to mainstream colleges and universities. Places like Colgate Rochester in relation to the Crozer Divinity School. It is seen as a model, mainstream model, that made room for black scholars in relation to naming their theology. One of my favorite people Reverend Dr. Henry Mitchell and his wife, Reverend Dr. Ella Pearson Mitchell, hail from there. And they joined forces through the United Theological Seminary to replicate what took place at Colgate Rochester. And here's what took place. The infrastructure of the mainstream theological institutions really didn't have the capacity to infuse the, uh, the black theology in everyday life. Yeah, might invite some tokens to sort of be there, but these colleges, these seminaries, actually provided a space for black theologians to gather every other month, either for a week or a weekend. 
And what would happen is when we would go to these theological schools, and I happen to have graduated from the United Theological Seminary, for a week or a weekend, it transformed into something that looked like a historically black college or university. For two days, one month, and then two months later for a week, and then two months later, the weekend, but it would transform. And I think that was a commendable effort to not just sugarcoat the need. The Union Theological Seminary just showed off in relation to this experience as uh, they featured many, many theologians, either through affiliation, preparation, or as faculty members. And we have uh, people like the immutable Cornell West. I don't think I need to say much. You all know him. He's a household word. We also have Dwight Hopkins. We also have Kane Hopefelder. And of course, we have James Cone. Cain Hopefelder started troubling biblical waters through a publication. Then he had the nerve to provide an Afrocentric companion so that we could understand the Bible from a black perspective. We also have uh, James Cone. We talked about James Cone. He's probably identified as the father of black theology, even though, know this, theology existed before yesterday, today, and even after tomorrow. I mean, the man just brought forth all kinds of publications, but the biggest part of his contribution is his challenge to the authenticity of theology. And he says, any theology that is indifferent to the theme of liberation is not Christian theology because it dwarfs our capacity to represent God the Almighty. He wrote <laughs> a book that was entitled Lamentations and the Blues, pointing out that some of our blues singers rivaled Jeremiah, if you want to hear a contemporary take on Lamentations, just listen to some of the blues that are sung by people that we might not even consider theological. Uh, people like B.B. King and so many others. Then uh, he talked about God of the oppressed. He talks about a black theology. It's beginning to give us another side of God a side of God that is not correlated with prosperity, a side of God that is inundated with struggle. But he doesn't stop there. This one, the cross and the lynching tree. Some people say that's just too much. Because you see, in this book, he states, and I think appropriately memorializes every black person, and probably, you know, they didn't only lynch black people. Every person who was lynched, he says, is a model of the crucifixion of Christ. And I would just say that I'm sharing these so that we can get some insight into what informed black theology, especially contemporary. Then we start moving into huh, discourse relative to race and gender. You see, there was a time when black theology was male black theology. And then we have other voices coming forth simply because you can't put God in any one box. So you have a discourse relative to race, and gender. And in relation to people emerging, addressing this discourse, we have people like Dwight Hopkins, who shared um, many books. The one I like is Shoes That Fit Our Feet. If you ever see that book by Dwight Hopkins, you see a bunch of black women on the cover. I love it. 
because when you try to wear shoes that don't fit your feet, they hurt, you limp, you get corns, you see. And so as he began to construct a holistic theology, he began to usher in or make room for women. And by the way, he has a book out that identifies collections of black theologians and Jamar Tisby is in his most recent book and we're looking forward to him being a part of our experience in relation to just giving place for other voices. Then we have <laughs> the Reverend Dr. J. Alfred Smith Sr. who is still emeritus at the Berkeley School of Theology, which used to be the American Baptist Seminary of the West. And that is where I got my doctorate. I'm, I'm kind of following Ian in relation to realizing that theology is not constrained to a denomination. You see, the Spirit of God will not be muted, not even by religious affiliation. And so as we think about J. Alfred, he ordained me, and when I got ordained, he, the, the only people he ordained that day were women, six women. And I mean, this was like 30 years ago. So you can imagine the brouhaha, but I must say, I think as a theologian honoring praxis and theory, he ordained more women in the history of this country than any other human being. He also joined forces in identifying a book entitled Women's Liberation, Jesus Style. You see, he understood that God was just too big to put in any denomination or universal take on theology. As we move through this statement, has rung true with me. He was the one that opened my eyes when he said, I don't know how it's going there, but there's not much difference between white racism and black misogyny. He said they're both biblically based, they're both oppressed. And so the discourse in black theology relative to the maleness and the femaleness of God begins to emerge. <clears throat> And as we continue, we are compelled to recognize black women who came to the forefront, sharing the fact that, uh, what, well, like Reverend Dr. Katie Cannon, she has an interview where she states, I, 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 you know, I, I came to the seminary and I was you know, trying to share about God from our perspective. And the struggle was that the classical theologians expected me to share the theology of privileged white males, and it just didn't fit. And so I kept telling them, I, I, I can't do that because that is not me. I'm black, I'm female, and I'm not privileged. And then when she had to talk to the feminist theologians, they wanted her to frame it in a certain pedagogy. They wanted her to put it in a certain box. And she said, no, I, I can't do that because that's not my experience. And I love the fact that as she shared it, she humbly said, I just spoke my truth and people began reading it. I just spoke my truth and people began buying the book. When it was just a struggle to bring into play the perspective of black female versions of God. Then we have Prathia Hall Wynn. Katie Cannon, Prathia Hall Wynn are both gone now. But Prathia Hall Wynn was affiliated with Martin Luther King through Boston University. She would break your heart as she implored black males to please be receptive to the feminine voices of God. Quiet as it's kept, among those of us who sort of walk in black theological circles, that term, I have a dream, if you don't believe me, you can look it up. I have a dream was introduced by Prathia Hall Wynn and borrowed by Martin Luther King. <laughs> 
So you can thank a black woman for I have a dream because what smart person isn't going to use whatever it takes to get the message across? Then we have <laughs> Jacqueline Grant at the Interdenominational Theological Union in Atlanta. Her, 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 her book, or one of her many, that sort of looks at the discourse relative to womanism and feminism is captured in the title, White Woman's Christ, Black Woman's Jesus. And I have um, a rendition of that statement or a manifestation of that statement that was offered through Vicki Winan's book, as long, I mean, song, as long as I got King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. And as she sings the song, she talks about Jesus as being her very best friend. She talks about Jesus giving her the power to challenge power. You see, as long as I got King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. White woman's Christ, black woman's Jesus. Then, and this is, I mean, it, it's not clear here, but I'm happy to share the link so you can see Vicki Winans just bringing that to the forefront. Black woman who is oppressed, poor, broke, looking funny, dressed funny, doing the best she can, pointing out that can't nobody do me like Jesus. And so I just want to sort of share that to expound on Jacqueline Grant's challenge, you see. And to <clears throat> allow, no, I don't want that. Okay. To allow us to understand that there is an expansion of God. But it's not just relative to bringing the female voices in. It's also relative to bringing in the theologies of people that we don't normally see as Christian. Not just poor people, not just disinherited people, but people who sing lamentations and sing songs and sing them in ways that us good Christian black folk may not approve. And you got people like Michael Eric Dyson coming on the scene saying Tupac had a theology. He's saying Beyonce got a theology. Jay-Z got a theology. Aretha, well, we probably think she does because she was singing spirituals, got a theology. You see, it's not just constrained to good black Christian folk, quote, unquote. He's pointing out that the theology of God is available to everybody. So he starts breaking the barriers relative to socioeconomic status in a different way. Then we have Audre Lorde. She comes on the scene in her book, Sister Outsider, pointing out that you're going to have to include old people, thank God. You're going to have to include people who are outside of the heterosexual orientation. You're going to have to include everybody as you simulate the infinity and the eternity of God. These are just a few of the theologians. As we move through recognizing that God is infinite and eternal, we, we're beginning to realize that black theology and other theologies are informing our capacity in relation to behavior. And black theology has been taking a lead in relation to spiritual interventions, meeting people where they are. The black Christian therapy movement is there. The Roots Counseling Center exists relative to an example of just using black theology to change behavior. There are many others counseling religious black women. You see, when you're counseling people, you got to counsel them based on their experience. They can't come up to our level. We have to come up to their level. And then there's also work that I have done in relation to demonstrating the power of God. My third book comes coming out is called The God in Me and the Me in God. And it allows us to see how the capacity to relate to God 
through our theologies, making room for the diversity of God helps in relation to behavior modification. Took 12 little girls and I said, I want you to draw God for me. I gave them magic markers, pens, pencils, three by five cards, big poster print, all of that. And they could go inside or outside. Draw God. And every one of those 12 little girls, this was a few years ago, drew God as an old, 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 old white man. So of course my question was, who do you know like that? Who do you trust like that? Who do you love like that? And you know what the answer was, I don't know nobody, I don't know. And that's understandable. For nine months we did an intervention and the protocol is featured, but at the end of nine months, <laughs> those girls had a different concept of God. When you look at the average, God was seen to them as a black woman around 32 years of age. It wasn't me. It was a range. Some little girls saw God as eight, and others still saw God as old. But instead of a white male, an old white female. What does that have to do with behavior modification? Statistically, their grades, every one of them, increased significantly. Self-reports from their parents demonstrated that they had learned how to manage such that they could be, at least for the time being, compliant. Their measures of self-efficacy and self-esteem increased. The God in me as much as the me in God. And when we think about God, when we think about Christ as our model of salvation, there's a difference. When we think about Jesus as our model of salvation, we get instruction on how to suffer, how to glory, and how to be victorious in our tribulation. Some of my girlfriends from my hometown in D.C. have... A, <laughs> Tribulation is such a part of their lives. I might say, how are you doing, Yolanda? And they would, she would say, girl, I'm tribulating today. This is just a, a part of life. But know this. She looked good. You see, she had on uh, her Sunday best. And when I say Sunday best, I'm not talking about just one outfit. Three or four closets of them. You see, because she, when she said tribulating, it wasn't something that would be used to pity her. And she's just letting me know I'm at my best right now because I'm going through something. You see, so when we talk about suffering based on 2 Corinthians, we realize that God's power is optimized in what the world perceives to be weakness. And then we talk about endurance. And we talk in terms of the race. It's not given to the swift, but it's given to those in, to endure until the end. And these are the kinds of uh, biblical sayings that the black community embraces. Suffering, endurance. Here it is, God has a purpose for your pain, a reason for your struggle, and a reward for your faithfulness. You see, there is room for the oppressed in relation to the theology of God. Finally, the deliverance. Uh-huh. God says, I am the Lord, your God, bringing uh, the Israelites out of the land of Egypt, breaking the bonds of slavery. So in relation to being able to sing theological songs in a strange land, yeah, we could probably learn something from black theology. How to tribulate and how to overcome. So as we move through, I just want to leave you with my theology. It is a poem that I shared with my emerging friend, Susie King, when I went to her home to just share time with her. I like her. 
And as uh, we were sharing, I shared the poem, and she said, you need to say that in the presentation. I said, you think so? I was going to, you know, exegete the Black National Anthem. She said, no, you, you need to say your, your theology. And so I shared this with you in closing. Marjorie's song, Marjorie's theology. Sometimes I think I'm going to die of boredom at this school. But then I realize, no, that isn't true. <laughs> Though lies in class perpetuate the teachings of some fools, I was an arrogant student. I must endure it all until they're through. And then when I go my merry way, a college graduate, I'll teach or preach or something that we do. I'll buy a house, a car, some clothes, and get all I can get. Yep, I'll become a bourgeois Negro too. Ain't that a shame? Ain't that a sin? Most certainly it is. All that potential going down the drain. Could she forget the plight of those around her way back when? Could she forget oppression and its pain? Uh -uh, she can't forget, oh no, she's black. And that she'll never change, no matter what she buys with credit cards. A credit card won't buy the things that makes one status quo. Yeah, she's still with us, a black social retard. I guarantee she'll be back. Hurt and mad, I bet. Just give her time. That's all she needs to learn. And she'll go out there and play her game and get slapped in the face. You see, she's black no matter what she earns. Oh, it's all right. We understand you had to learn your way. You see, we never ceased our love for you. And now you know that's not the path that leads to brighter days. Now we can work to extricate our blues. We'll teach our young to love the Lord and not just worldly wealth. We'll show them that there is black beauty true. And they're going to know God's loves our wealth and with it comes all things. No lies for them, <laughs> we'll tell them what is true. And then when they grow, they'll play no games and get slapped in the face. They'll know the pathway to a brighter day. Oppression won't move fast enough to keep up with their pace as they move on and go their merry way. That is my theology. We all have one. I share it humbly, looking forward to perhaps the day when I can hear yours. I want to thank you for your time and your indulgence. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to allow for any? Or just forgive us. It's, well, it's a little bit after 1030. Do you want to speak to what next week will mm -hmm. be? Yep. Yeah. Th thank you. Th thank you, Clover. Next week, we have reserved for questions comments. And you have um, three by five cards available. If you would write them down and share them with us, then we can prepare in relation to answering some of the questions that we receive, as well as providing a space for spontaneous questions to be asked. So I look forward to next week as Malcolm and I will be sharing with you. And we're going to have a raffle too, but you got to be here to get it. <laughs> Again, we thank um, Reverend Dr. Lewis for another mind-stretching and nourishing um, opportunity for education. And I feel like this is, these are just seeds for what we will do um, as, as the weeks and months and years come on. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you. We are so glad you're here. If you are going to stay for worship, Starts at 11. Glad to have you. And, uh, and if not, I bid you peace and grace as you go your way.